Raleigh Cigarettes present Earl Stanley Gardner's A Life in Your Hands. Did you hear the glass crash? Was the store insured? How soon did the car start? Listen while we place a life in your hand. Decisions recently issued by the Federal Trade Commission, an agency of the United States government, should convince you. You cannot believe in throat tests. You cannot believe in nose tests. But you can believe your own eyes. So take the Raleigh eye test and see for yourself the only real important difference between leading brands of cigarettes. A difference you can believe because it's a difference you can see. The Raleigh Profit Sharing Premium Coupon. <laughs> You never know when you step from the safety of your home, when you may witness a violent death and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard and suddenly find yourself with a life in your hands. Murder is a dark enigma that strikes fear into the heart of man. Strange, baffling, mysterious. But the darkest crime one man can invent, another man can unravel. Such a man as Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, the world's most popular mystery writer, creator of Perry Mason, Doug Selby, and many other outstanding characters. Dinner will be ready in a few minutes, Jonathan. Did you have a pleasant drive up? Yes, thank you, Sarah. I'm often complimented on my famous brother, Jonathan Kegg, these days. This work you do is amicus curiae. Just exactly what is it? Well, literally, it means friend of the court. I don't act for either the prosecution or the defense. I simply cross-examine witnesses in the interest of truth. Goodness, if you don't work for either side, who pays you? No one. Which is one reason why there aren't more men serving as amicus curiae. I've been fortunate in my earlier years, and I can now afford to do this type of work. I've always wanted to do it. It sounds fascinating, Jonathan. And very worthwhile, too. I hope it does some good. I've been lucky enough to bring out the truth on several occasions... But the work never stops. You never know when or where violence will strike. Even now, somewhere in the city, there may be a crime in the making. Back at the school, kids! Tell the bell! Lunch is over! Hurry up for school! <laughs> Look, Papa, I've just got to get that pen. If my Dad ever finds out I'm that I... sorry, Billy. You know the rules. Oh, yes. No charge over three dollars. Here's your cigarettes and the lighter fluid. That makes it two dollars, 85 cents. You get charged now. I cannot charge no more. But, Papa, Dad gave me the money for the pan. Then what do you do with it? Oh, I took Mary to the show, and then we had something to eat. Oh, you've just got to trust me, Papa. Billy, you run up with the biggest charge. You were in hawk with three dollars. is enough. Believe in me. Papa knows how far in a hockey kid he should go. Now, do like I say. Tell you, Papa. You do that, eh? I thought you were a pal. Sure, you're a great pal. You'd do anything for a friend. Well, now I know. And I'm going to do something real nice for you. I don't think you do right, Papa. I don't think you should let these bambinos or money. Ma, they are not the bambinos, Mama. They are young men and women. They must get used to pay what they owe. And I never let them charge you more than three dollars. Uh, you must like the kids, Papa. Uh, you're not the fool, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't fool you. Uh, the kids, they, they, they don't fool me. What's the matter, Mama? Uh, nothing. You look like you see ghosts. I think for a minute I see across the street the man who had to come about these machines. I don't see him. He's a gone now. Papa. Hmm. Ah, don't you worry about him. You think he's a mean to blow our store down there? No, 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 no. He's just a bluffer, Mama. You think maybe we should... Mama, we sell the kids things that is good for them. We let them have a little bit of credit. We listen to their troubles. But 
I will never teach them to gamble. I will never take their money with the slot machines. Who are those guys who threaten us to think they are top? But I'm a top man too. I will take it. Papa! Put down that meat cleaver. See, see, Mama. But I swear, I die for these kids first. I beg your pardon. Are you Mr. Gaetano? Si, senor. I am Papa Gaetano. I'm George Nelson. My son Bill comes in here a lot. Oh, oh, you are Bill Nelson's papa. Oh, he's a good boy. I am so glad to know you. Tell me, does Bill owe you any money? Oh, see, he owes a little, nothing to worry about. We let the kids run bills up to three dollars. Everyone in the school owes something. Well, that's not too bad. Last week I gave Bill five dollars to buy a fountain pen. The school called me at the office this morning to tell me that Bill didn't have a pen and that his English teacher requires that the work be done in ink. I understand Bill buys such things here. I wondered if he did buy the pen. Mr. Nelson, I don't like to tell you this. Bill is a good boy. He come to me asking me to trust him for a new pen, but I don't do it. Bill, he owes $2.85 now. A new pen costs uh, 3 $4. So Bill wanted the pen on credit. Well, I know how to deal with that. Mr. Nelson, you got lots of money. Maybe you spend so much time making money, you don't uh, learn to know your kid. Now, look here. A uh, oh boy, he's quite some guy. He's got lots of problems. But he's worth everything you got. All the mom and me we got is this store. But our boy, we're going to put it through college. So, you see, we pretty rich people. Maybe you think about that, eh? I can handle my own affairs, thank you. Good day. Hey, anybody home? I'm here, Bill, in the living room. I want to have a little talk with you. Oh? What about, Dad? I gave you $5 last week to buy a new fountain pen. Yes, sir. The school called me today. They said you didn't have a pen. Dad, I... That's right, Dad. What did you do with the $5? I... I spent it. I took Mary out last Saturday night. You get an allowance to cover things like that? What can you do on $5 a week? That isn't even enough to buy gas for the car. Don't you raise your voice to me, young man. You've got a lot more privileges than most boys your age. Oh, don't start that routine, Dad. That will do. Not only did you take the $5 I gave you and spend it for your own pleasure, but then you turned around and tried to charge a pen at the Gaetano shop, where, incidentally, you already owe nearly $3. Who told you that? I was at the store today. Mr. Gaetano told me. He ratted on me? I know the whole story, and I'm not going to put up with this sort of thing. I think it's high time you had a lesson, my fine buck. I'll get even with those Gatanos. You'll get even with no one. Don't you dare even mention such a thing. And not only that, you're not going to your school dance this Saturday. Is that clear? Oh, Dad, don't say that. I'm going to sing with the band and Mary's got a new dress and... Oh, guys, Dad, I've got to go to that dance. You heard me, Bill. You're not going. But, Dad... There will be no argument. I think you'd better go to your room now. It takes the rest of my life. I'll fix Papa Gatano. Smokers, it pays two ways to smoke Raleigh cigarettes. It pays with top quality smoking enjoyment. It pays with luxury premiums. There are over 75 beautiful premiums, and you can get them just like gifts. Just smoke Raleigh's and save the profit sharing coupons. And remember a recent decision by the Federal Trade Commission. An agency of the United States government should prove to you... You cannot believe in throat tests. You cannot believe in nose tests. But you can believe your own eyes. So take the Raleigh eye test and see for yourself the only important difference between leading brands of cigarettes. A difference you can believe because it's a difference you can see. The Raleigh profit-sharing premium coupon. Eighty-five? Here's a dollar. Keep the change. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, not quite.
tonight, 11.30. Lodge meeting was over earlier than usual. What's, what's going on? Oh, my gosh. Not me, buddy. All right, you. You want trouble, you'll get it. Let go of me. I didn't do anything. Oh, yeah. Oh. Then I'll take care of you, you young punk. Hey, come here. I got the guy that started it. This kid's a fireball. much breakfast, Jonathan. Would you like more coffee? Oh, uh, yes, thanks. Uh, just a half cup. I was just reading about this high school lad that set fire to some store near here since I last visited you. Yes, isn't that terrible? Oh, those poor Gitanos. They're such nice people. And that store was all they had in the world. They planned and worked for years to be able to put their boy through college, too. I don't know what'll happen to them now. They lost everything. Tell me, Sarah, this, uh, Bill Nelson, what sort of lad is he? I don't know him. I understand that Bill's a nice boy. A little spoiled, maybe. His father's quite well-to-do. That's interesting. If the father is well off, maybe the Catanos could recover from him what they've lost. I think I'll drop into court this morning. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Kegg. Your reputation has preceded you. Thank you, Your Honor. In the case of the People versus William Nelson, the responsibility for the fire can become a very important factor as far as the Gitanos are concerned. To assist in fixing that responsibility beyond question, I should like the privilege of entering the case as amicus curiae. I'm not sure I see the necessity, Mr. Kegg, but... Considering both the loss to the Gaetanos and the youth of the defendant, I will grant your request. You may proceed, Mr. Kegg. You are Bill Nelson to the Gaetano's store? No, sir, I didn't. What did you do? I didn't do anything. Why were you in front of the store at 11.30 the night of the fire? I just out for a walk, that's all. And just happened to pass the store, huh? Yeah, that's right. Bill, you took an oath when you came up here. What did you promise? To tell the truth. And by whose name did you swear to tell the truth? Well, I... I am telling the truth. I, I didn't set fire to the store. Bill, remember that oath. Well, I, I didn't set the fire. I believe you, Bill. But I also believe you aren't telling everything. Why were you at the store at that time of night? Why, Bill? Well, I... I didn't, I... Why were you there? Papa Gatano told Dad about the pen, and Dad wouldn't let me go to the dance, and I was sore. So you went to the store to get even? <laughs> yes, but I didn't mean to burn it down. I just threw a rock through the window. You caught young Nelson after the fire started, Mr. Marcelli? That's right. I heard the window crash, and I saw this kid run down the street, and I went after him, caught him. You say you went after him. You mean ran? No, I was sitting in my car when it happened. I started the car when I saw him run. I caught up with him, jumped out of the car, and tackled him. You were in your car when you heard the glass break? That's right. Did you see any fire in the Gitano store at that time? N no, no. How many other cars were in the street at that time? Mine was the only one. You were parked on the same side of the street as the Gitano store? Yeah. Why? Well, why not? That's all. You are Papa Gitano? Si, senor. That's uh, what they call me. I understand the fire wiped you out, Mr. Gitano. You had no insurance? No, senor. Two, the fire, she's burned up even $3,000 that was hidden in the mattress. 
And nothing in the shop was covered by insurance? No, senor, nothing. Would you mind telling us just what happened at the time of the fire? Well, it's... Uh, I'm not sure what time, 11 or 12 o'clock. Mom and me is asleep. Well, uh, we both wake up at the same time. We smell a smoke. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Gaetano. You and your wife live in the store building? Si, si, senor. We got the sitting room, a bedroom, and a kitchen in the back. I see. Please go on. Si, si. Well, like I say, we smell a smoke. I go open the door to the front. Eh? Everything, she's a fire. While I got the door open, the fire come in the room. I run, I get to Mama, and we run out the back to the alley and... Uh, 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 Mr. Catano, thank you. Do you know Mr. Marcelli, the one who captured young Nelson? Si, senor, I know him. Do you know him well, Mr. Gaetano? He's tried to make Mom and me put in the slot the machines and take the kids' the money. That's a lie. I never did anything like that in my life. Water. Water in the court. That's no lie, Nick Marcelli. You come into the store, you say you've got to put in the machine. That's true. That will do. Sit down, Mr. Gaetano. And you be quiet, Marcelli. Now, Mr. Gaetano... When Marcelli came to you and wanted you to put in slot machines, what did you do? I tell him to get out. You see, Mr. Keg, the kids, they're nice kids, but their kids are just the same. Any kid you make it easy for him to gamble, he's going to gamble. Mom and me, we try to help the kids. I'm not going to teach them to gamble, so I tell Marcelli to get out. Did he threaten you? I don't know. If he did, I don't pay attention. When did all this happen? Three, four times he come to the store. Did you see him the day of the fire? The day before, Mama, she thinks she see him. That was also the day Bill Nelson tried to charge a new fountain pen. See? Which you wouldn't sell to him. Tell me this. Did Bill Nelson buy anything that day? See, si, senor. He buys a package of the cigarettes uh, uh, and... And what? Oh, Mr. Keg, Bill is a nice boy. He no burn our store. What else did Bill Nelson buy that afternoon? He's buy a big can of a lighter flu. That is all. Your Honor, there are two possibilities in this case as I see it. In order to determine which is true, we need the testimony of a person who was merely an innocent bystander. We will subpoena anyone you desire, Mr. Keg. And that person must testify to what he saw or heard. Ladies and gentlemen, few of us ever consider that we ourselves might at any moment witness a crime. Could you recall exactly what you have heard? Or you would hold a life in your hands. You cannot believe in throat tests. You cannot believe in nose tests. Decisions recently issued by the United States Government Federal Trade Commission should convince every intelligent smoker that you cannot believe in throat tests, you cannot believe in nose tests. These distinguished government experts appointed by law to protect the public against false and misleading advertising claims have declared... One, there is no reliable basis for claims that one brand is superior to another in respect to throat irritants. Two, all manufacturers of leading brands of cigarettes buy their leaf tobacco from the same sources. With these two facts in mind, give yourself Raleigh's famous eye test. Hold up two packs of cigarettes. One of Raleigh's, one of any other leading brand. Turn them around. Take the eye test. You'll see the difference. Yes, you'll see that only Raleigh's have a coupon on the back. And because Raleigh cigarettes give you rich, fine tobaccos, a smooth, satisfying smoke, that Raleigh profit-sharing coupon is the only real important difference between leading brands of cigarettes. It's a difference you can believe because it's a difference you can see. So switch to Raleigh cigarettes, America's greatest cigarette value. <laughs> Jonathan Kegg is summoned to the stand. Timothy Murphy, who had just arrived home from a lodge meeting when he heard the window of the Gatano store across the street shattered. 
Mr. Kegg is beginning his cross-examination of this innocent bystander. Mr. Murphy, on the night in question, you had just returned to your apartment after having been to a lodge meeting? Correct. What happened? Well, it was about 11.30. I paid off the cab driver and was unlocking the door to our apartment when I heard a crash of glass. I looked around and saw the boy who had broken the window running down the street. A car started up from the curb to follow him. From that moment until the boy was captured, did you lose sight of him? No, not for a second. Mr. Murphy, let's get this straight. You swear that you saw Bill Nelson throw a rock or an object through the Gitano store window and then turn and run down the street. An automobile started up from the curb and followed him. That's absolutely correct, Mr. Kay. You reside across the street from the Gitano store? Yes, sir. You were unlocking the door to the apartment house where you live. That's right. Is it dark in the doorway to your apartment? I... Yes, yes, it's pretty dark. When you insert the key into your apartment door, do you do it by feel, or is there sufficient light for you to see? Well, I... let me think now. I... I guess I do it by feeling. Well, then, Mr. Murphy, while you were concentrating on opening your front door, perhaps your other hand was on the knob. Well, it... Oh, of course. I was prepared to push the door open. Then how can you swear that Bill Nelson broke that window? I saw him. With one hand on the knob of your front door and the other putting the key in the lock, how could you have seen an action taking place behind your back? Well, I, I, I saw the boy running. Then you do not know of your own knowledge that Bill Nelson threw an object through the Gitano store window just before you saw him running. Well, I naturally assume... Assuming will not do, Mr. Murphy. Sworn testimony must be what you actually saw or heard, and nothing more. Because you heard the glass break and saw the defendant running, you concluded he was guilty. It was a natural assumption. Possibly, Mr. Murphy, but still only an assumption. Now, I want you to put all that out of your mind and tell us exactly what you saw and heard. I heard the store glass crash. I turned to look. I heard Marcelli get in his car and start after young Nelson. I could see the running lad quite clearly by the streetlight. Mr. Murphy... Was there any other car in that street besides Marcellus? No. No, I'm sure there wasn't. Did the car start immediately after the glass crash? Immediately? Well, almost. Mr. Murphy, between the time you heard the crash of Gaetano's window and the car started, did you see or hear anything else? I heard the lad running, and of course I heard Marcella get into his car. I didn't see him till after I heard the bell, which attracted my attention. A bell? What kind of bell? One of those tinkling things like they have on shop doors. And now I come to think of it, I I heard a door open and close. Before or after you heard Mr. Marcelli get into his car? I, it all happened so fast. I, I'm afraid I'm getting a bit confused. Let me ask you this. How long have you lived at your present address? Eight years. Have you ever been in the Gatano store? Oh, yes, several times. Do they have a bell such as you say you heard? Yes. Yes, they do. What other shop in the neighborhood has such a bell? Well, there isn't another shop of any kind for three blocks. Ours is a residential neighborhood, Mr. Keg. Everything is apartments or houses except Gitano's and uh, the high school. Now, be very careful, Mr. Murphy. What exactly did you hear? And in what order? I heard the glass. Then someone running. Then... Uh, then I heard a door open. The bell tinkled. The door closed. Then uh, then Marcelli got into his car and started after the kid. Was there anyone else on the street? No one. Are you sure of this? I'm absolutely certain that's what happened, Mr. Kay. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. You have rendered a great service. You may step down. Your Honor, I would like to call Nick Marcelli back. Nick Marcelli to the stand. Where do you live, Marcelli? Well, what's that got to do... On Madison Drive. Own your own home? Yeah, but... I... Your uh, car is paid for, of course. Both of them are. Have you a bank account? <laughs> I got plenty in the bank. And I don't owe any income taxes either. Good. I don't think I follow this line of questioning, Mr. Keg. Is it relevant? I beg the court's pardon. Thanks to the testimony of our innocent bystander, we know who the arsonist is. Order! I still don't follow, Mr. Keg. 
I promise to connect up, Your Honor, although possibly a bit unconventionally. I'll expect you to do so. You may continue. Marcelli, you said you were sitting in your car when Bill threw the brick into Gaetano's store. That you started the car and chased him. That's right. But Mr. Murphy heard a car door open and close. How do you explain that? Well, it must have been another car. By your own testimony, there was no other car in the street. What, anybody? Mr. Murphy also heard the door of Gaetano's store after Bill Nelson started to run away. He could tell by the bell. There must have been somebody else who Oh, was... no, there wasn't, Marcelli. You were trying to force the Gaetanos to put in slot machines. They refused. So you set fire to their store. The kid done no. it. No. It was sheer coincidence, Marcelli, that Bill Nelson threw that rock through the window just as you set the fire. It gave you a perfect opportunity to place the entire blame on him. But he tossed the rock? Yes, he did. And for that, he shall be punished. But you, Nick Marcelli, are the arsonist. You burned those innocent, God-fearing people out of their home, their future. Didn't you? Didn't you, Marcelli? Yes, yeah, sure. That's but... all I want to know. That substantiates the truth. Because it is the only explanation for the things which Mr. Murphy testified to having heard. I'm certainly glad to discover the real arsonist, Mr. Kegg. But uh, you still have not connected up your questions to Marcelli about his property. Your Honor, the Gaetanos were ruined by this fire. Nick Marcelli owns enough to make good their losses. I intend to sue him in a civil action to recover on behalf of the Gitanos. His criminal conviction cannot be used against him in civil court. That is true, Your Honor. But if any witness tells a different story in civil court than the one he has told here, he is liable for perjury. I think the Gitanos will be able to start all over again. I believe when the civil court jury verdict is heard, it will be in favor of the Gitanos. Your Honor... We, the jury, find that the defendant, Nick Marcelli, has caused grievous harm to one Giuseppe Catano, the plaintiff. We assess the real damage to Mr. Catano at $7,500. We also levy punitive damages against Nick Marcelli in the amount of $100,000. <laughs> You must get a lot of satisfaction out of helping to see justice done, Mr. Kegg. I do, Mr. Wallace. Particularly as in this case, where it's been possible to recover at least the financial loss suffered by the Gitanos. Well, Mr. Wallace, I'll see you next week. Good night, Mr. Kegg. Friends, here's a cordial invitation for each of you to be with us next week when you will again hear Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, author of the internationally famous Perry Mason stories and many others. And remember... You can believe your own eyes. So look for the pack with the coupon on the back. Rolly Cigarettes, America's greatest cigarette value. Pipe smokers, you'll like Sir Walter Raleigh pipe tobacco. You'll like the rich, full-bodied flavor of Sir Walter Raleigh, never bitter, never biting. You'll like the way Sir Walter Raleigh smokes cool, clean, never leaves a soggy heel in your pipe. Just a nice, dry egg. And you'll like that grand aroma of Sir Walter Raleigh. You and your pipe will be welcome everywhere. Yes, man, you'll like everything about Sir Walter Raleigh. It's the quality pipe tobacco of America. A Life in Your Hands is created by Earl Stanley Gardner, produced and directed by Jack Simpson. Script by the McKees with musical effects by Adele Scott, conducted by Whitey Berquist. Jonathan Kegg is played by Carlton Cadell. This is Mike Wallace inviting you to be with us again next week when Raleigh Cigarettes, the pack with the coupon on the back, will again place A Life in Your Hands. Tomorrow, Dangerous Assignment joins the big parade on NBC.